Today on School, we're being joined by Dr. Carl Picard, who's a psychologist in private practice in Austin, Texas. And we're going to talk about issues of childhood and adolescent self-esteem, which is always an important issue, but it's become a little bit more in the air recently, because about a month before this show is being recorded, uh, Netflix has decided to release a show that became wildly popular called 13 Reasons Why, based on a young adult novel from 2007 of the same name. And the show has, at its core, the issues of self-esteem, because the main character, Hannah Baker, is a teenage girl who's decided to commit suicide. And the show essentially walks us through her perception of what the reasons were that kind of culminated in her lowering self-esteem and subsequent decision to take her own life. So the issue has been, uh, you know, very talked about. It's this, the show's been watched by, you know, teens and 20-somethings and adults. It's gotten a lot of people talking about self-esteem. So in this episode, we want to walk through things like what is self-esteem, what are the elements that potentially go into it, and what can we as teachers and parents and peers do to make sure that we're nurturing positive self-esteem rather than negative self-esteem. So before we start, I would like to just introduce Dr. Picard real quick. Dr. Carl Picard is a psychologist in private counseling and public lecturing practice in Austin, Texas. Picard received his BA and MED from Harvard and his PhD from University of Texas at Austin. He's a member of the American and the Texas Psychological Associations. He's the author of 15 parenting books as well as books of illustrated psychology and adult and children's fiction. He's also written several articles for a variety of media outlets. His books include Surviving Your Child's Adolescence, Boomerang Kids, a revealing look at why so many of our children are failing on their own and how parents can help, and Why Good Kids Act Cool. So I hope this show gets us thinking about self-esteem and the elements that go into it and our potential responsibility in nurturing healthy self-esteem in our young people. All right, we are here today with Dr. Carl Picard, and we're going to be talking about self-esteem in childhood and adolescence, something that you um, that is central, I'm sure, to your, to your counseling work and your writing work. So, Dr. Picard, uh, the first question I want to get to is we talk a lot about self-esteem and the importance of self-esteem, but pretty often we don't really stop to define what we mean by self-esteem and the things that make up self-esteem. So, I feel like we should start there. Self, I guess, number one, self-esteem is, you know, it's an American concept. You know, William James, you know, hit on it in, I don't know, turn of the century, end of the 20th century. And uh, it's a, it fits America, I think, because we are a self-individualistic kind of a country. A communal country probably would not find this concept particularly useful. They might not even recognize it. Um, I'm, a, I'm a practitioner. And in, as a practitioner, I find the concept pretty useful. I don't, in a research sense, I don't know about that. But as a practitioner, you know, what we're talking about are two very, very fundamental things. Because if you take the term self-esteem, what you've got is you essentially have two concepts in one, self and esteem. And if you divide that out, you can, you can see the meaning and the power of the, of the word. Because the self part of it is a definitional statement. You know, how do I define myself? That is, I am, you know, where I go to school. I am my friends, my family, my interests, you know, whatever. So that, you know, that's one, one thing uh, so that the person can really delineate, you know, the expressions and associations which essentially you know, complete the, their sense of self-definition. That's just half of it. The other half of it is evaluation, esteem. How do I value myself? Uh, and it makes a huge difference whether I value myself, you know, positively or negatively uh, in terms of how I treat myself and in terms of the kind of treatment that I expect to receive and allow. Uh, so I think the goal, at least for me, the goal working with parents around their kids' self-esteem essentially too is you want your kid to be able to define themselves as broadly as possible. If you have a kid and their only, you know, their only pillar of self-esteem is that they're really good in sports 
and they and you talk to the kid and says sports are everything you know without sports i'd be nothing and then they get injured they're in a very very hard place because they have no other sources of self-esteem so you want the kid to have multiple sources of self-esteem the other part of it is that in terms of evaluation what hap what happens if you have a kid who you know thinks well of themselves but what happens is they make some kind of a mistake and they get in difficulty and so now what happens is they start based on that they start evaluating themselves you know in increasingly negative ways so the kid comes in and they you know and there's no question you know they really messed up so they start but they don't start talking about that they start talking about what a sorry individual and human being they are for having acted this way. And I finally I say, hey, wait a minute. I thought we were here to talk about what happened and how to move on. And what I'm saying is you're taking this time and this unhappiness and you're hammering on yourself. The time when you, <laughs> you get in difficulty for yourself is not a time to beat up on yourself. It's a time to treat yourself well, to generate the energy, to be able to recover and move on. So you want, you want your kid to essentially to define themselves broadly and evaluate themselves kindly. And those, those pillars are very, very, very important. Um, and uh, the self-esteem is like, it's like a mindset uh, and it has motivational power. Uh, and you know, what happens is that if the kid has quote, low self-esteem and low is usually negative self-esteem, what that means is, uh, you know, that they see, that, you know, number one is they, their vision of possibilities for themselves is greatly diminished. Uh, and number two is, you know, they don't think they are worth treating well either by themselves or anybody else. So it's a serious issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, you know, as you go through adolescence, at each stage of adolescence, there are essentially, I think there's a, you know, there's a kind of a self-esteem challenge uh you know that the kid has to meet uh and uh i mean if you take a look at for me the four stages of adolescence nine to 13 is uh, is early adolescence when the kid separates from childhood so there the self-esteem problem is that they've they've just let go of childhood and there's a lot of valuable stuff that they've separated off from in order to make this transition uh, so now you know how are they going to give up and cope with that loss you know, and maintain positive definition and positive self-evaluation when there's so much that they miss about what yeah. they had in childhood. So that's a, yeah. that's a, that's a challenge. Now, I know you've done a lot of work on, on kind of the transition from childhood to adolescence and yeah. stages of adolescence. So why don't we go uh, there because you kind of brought up the kind of the differences between different stages of adolescence regarding self-esteem. So are there different uh, things that maybe teachers, parents, et cetera, should be thinking about when we're thinking of a child's self-esteem versus a, a self-esteem of someone in early adolescence versus maybe a later stage of adolescence, or are the elements fairly similar between stages? No, no, no I think I think there, there are definitely differences. Like, I, like in early adolescence, nine to 13, when the kid's separating off, I think parents have to understand that adolescence is an act of courage. You know, and what this kid is doing is, you know, they are giving up a lot of stuff that they really miss. And so you, you know, that's why, you know, the kid is so moody and broody because, you know, they're trying to move forward, but they miss what they had. And, uh, and parents just have to understand that this is, you know, uh, this kid is going to be giving them mixed messages for a while. Leave me alone. You never pay attention to me. You know, let me do it. You never do for me. And they're, they're caught in this tug of war between wanting to be older and adolescent and wanting to be a child still. And parents can get frustrated with that mixed message. That's an honorable message. This kid is honorably ambivalent when they enter adolescence because they have so much to give up. And in the early part of it, they haven't got anything positive to replace it with. So, I mean, it's a, you know, it's a scary, challenging time. Well, then you move into mid-adolescence, say 13 to 15, and there now the kid is, you know, they crested into adolescence, all right, but now they're trying to, you know, set up an independent family of friends to begin this development of social identity. And now what the kid discovers is that life with friends, it can be a pretty rough deal. 
you know, so then you get, you know, you get all the kind of social cruelty stuff that starts happening, you know, climaxes in middle school where you have developmentally insecure kids you know, doing harsh things to each other, not because they're bad kids, because they're struggling to find some kind of social belonging to make up for the definition that they've lost. Um, and so you get, you know, you get teasing and, and, and rumoring and bullying and, and, and ganging up and exclusion and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that uh, one of the things I think parents need to do, because those, those, if you're on the receiving end of those things, that does not help your self-esteem. Because all of a sudden, you know, if you're in a bad place, you think that because people are treating you badly, you must be a bad person. Uh, and so what parents have to do is they have to let the kid know when they enter, enter middle school, I think, is uh, parents have to say, look, just so you know, we know that relationships can get tougher right now. And uh, we're not saying, you know, that necessarily it will, but you'll see it around you. It might happen to you. If it ever comes your way, please tell us so we can give you support and we can give you strategies. The reason the kids a lot of times don't do that is because they think they're now independent and they should be able to manage their own lives. So they got to keep parents out and also the code of the schoolyard, you know, you don't tell other people. Uh, but parents have to be able to get in there so that the kid can make this absolutely essential discrimination. The, the, the best example of it, years ago I was working with a, a group of parents who were uh, the, the uh, little people of America, either parents are dwarfed or they have a kid who's dwarfed. And a mom got up and she said, the story she told was that her son who's dwarfed comes home from middle school and he tells her about his day. And he tells her all the mean things that have been said to them all day long. So the mom starts tearing up and the kid looks at him and he says, mom, why are you crying? Mom says, well, gosh, what a horrible way to be treated during the day. And the kid gives her a big smile. He says, mom, that's not about me. That's about them. Mm -hmm. And the kid is, you know, how the kid was able to make that discrimination. I don't know, but that's the critical discrimination to make. When somebody treats you meanly, it is not about you. It is about them wanting to act meanly. And if you yeah. can make that discrimination, then you don't take it personally. And that's the difference between being a victim and being a target. You don't want your kid to be on the receiving end of it, period. However, if they are, you want them to be a target because targets have choices. Victims have no choice and they give up and you don't want that. That's why parents have to be let in because you want to be able to be there as a coach to help your kid maintain self-esteem during a time when social treatment can get much more difficult than it was before. You know, and then you move into late adolescence, 15 to 18, that's really more the high school years and acting more grown up. And now what you get, is you, you get more, you know, you get more risk taking going on and trying older activities. Uh, and it's very hard sometimes to refuse to go along with those activities, partly because you see them as rites of passages to being older. Uh, and so now what happens, kids can, in fact, you know, make some serious choices around risk taking and get themselves in serious difficulty. Uh, and, you know, again, at that point, you know, what parents are, you know, in the business of doing, you know, is not criticizing the kid for a choice that went wrong, but helping the kid learn from what happened and be able to recover themselves. Again, what happens sometimes is, I mean, parents, they get scared by this risk taking, you know, and why wouldn't they be? I mean, because there's some serious things could happen. But fearful parenting during late adolescence is not a good deal. I mean, you've got to be able to say, you know, you know, <laughs> life gets more complicated, the risks get more dangerous, you know, the decision making gets, gets harder. Let's just talk about what happened and the choices you made, what you learned and how you can move forward on this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, you know, finally you get the last stage of adolescence, which unhappily is, I mean, I guess that's the age you're mostly dealing with, yeah. you know, 18 to 23. And that, you know, unhappily is the hardest stage of adolescence of all, because that's trial independence where these kids are more off on their own uh, and they're slipping and sliding and breaking commitments and they're losing their way and they don't have much sense of direction and it's mal maximum alcohol and drug use. I mean, just, you know, it's really hard to find your footing. And so what happens is uh, these kids lose their footing. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, in, in some cases, you know, they'll boomerang home for a while because they can't maintain footing. And that's okay if they do. They just need more time to gather themselves and move out. Uh, but now what happens is that, uh, you know, these are, you know, it's, it's easy for a kid to say to themselves, here I am, you know, and I'm 21 years old. And look what I did. You know, and it's really easy for them to hammer on themselves. And parents need to be able to say, look, you know, people make mistakes all their lives. And parents can actually share some of the mistakes they made. Let's just talk about what happened, what you can learn from this, and, you know, what you need to do now to recover yourself. Uh, so that, I mean, that's what each stage of the way there are self-esteem issues, I think. We're talking kind of about the difference between how an individual processes what's going on around them and what's right. going on around them. So the environment versus how you process the environment. Right. And the show, uh, 13 Reasons Why, that I mentioned in the introduction, okay. uh, is really largely to me about a character who is not being treated very well and she's struggling with how to deal with that. Right. Which obviously a really hard thing because if you're being bullied or uh, being mistreated, it's really hard to see any positive in right. that and come through that. So the question I have is, you know, for parents and teachers who are, you know, who see kids who are being potentially mistreated by others, right. you know, how do we go about fostering uh, a person's inner strength ability to do what the student uh, who was a dwarf right. uh, did, which was be able to say, no, it's, that's about them. I'm not going to let it affect me to the degree that that's possible. Right. Well, I think you've got, I mean, your, your term is the key. I mean, we have to take responsibility for how we process what happens to us in life. And, you know, we can either, you know, take it as a sign that, you know, something is the matter with us and therefore get down on us. So we can say, look, this just happened. I don't know exactly know why it happened, but it did. And I didn't like it happening. But, you know, and then you can kind of depersonalize it, take a look at the damage and move forward. But if you have a kid who doesn't have, can't take that kind of processing responsibility and just assumes that the way other people see me is the way I must be, you know, and anybody who treats me badly, that just shows I'm worth treating badly, you know. You know, it's very hard when you're counseling a kid like that. You know, the kid will get angry. You're saying it's my fault? I'm saying, no, I'm not saying that's exactly what I'm not saying. <laughs> what I'm saying is that how you interpret what happened to you makes a big difference because your job now is you got to recover from a really hard situation. So what you need is maximum positive energy to do that. And if you're going to hammer on yourself at this point, you're going to reduce that energy. You're going to make recovery much more difficult. So let's talk about taking responsibility for how you can interpret what happened as something other people did to you, not what you did to yourself, what other people did to you, you know, how it feels and what you need to do now to take care of yourself to move on. Yeah. And the other question similar to that is you mentioned, um, it, it sounds like a common theme through adolescence for, yeah. from early to late, is a person in some ways kind of finding their social place, finding their place in the world. I'm not quite a child. I'm not quite an adult. Right. Um, I want to find where I fit in. So with students who uh, or children, adolescents who can't seem to find where they fit in or a place that seems to work for them, Right. similar to the character Hannah Baker trying to find her place. Right. Uh, what is it that adults can or should be doing to facilitate students and, and adolescents finding their place so that they can kind of develop a self-esteem? Uh, well, I think, I think partly, I mean, that's, I mean, you, you, it's, it's a neat question because, I mean, how, how would the kid know? I mean, how would the 13-year-old know how to figure out what to do so they could feel better about themselves. In most cases, or in many cases, they don't know. So the role of the parent is always door opener. The role of the parent is to say, look, I don't know. It sounds like it's pretty unhappy right now. What I'd like you to do is, is I'm not talking about a career commitment here, but let's take a look at a, a, a bunch of different kinds of activities that you might just try out 
to see how that feels. Uh, and you know, and here, you know, let's talk about them, and then we'll, we'll give you a you know, you take, you choose which one to try, and we'll support that for as long as it's of interest to you. Uh, because the kid needs to know that, you know, interest, you know, some some kids have an abiding interest from early childhood, and it carries them all the way through. But that is the exception; that is not the rule. When kids separate from childhood, they lose a lot of interest. And you have to be able to find new ways to do that. And that takes being willing to experiment and being able to see possibilities. The role of the parent is always to take the largest possible perspective on that kid so they can see possibilities the kid cannot. And then can, in fact, you know, help guide the kid in those directions to see if they can discover something. And sometimes with early adolescent kids, you get the wonderful, wonderful thing. You had a, I had a kid... Uh, I don't know. I don't know if you have you must you must have baseball in your part of the country. Youth leagues. Mm -hmm. Baseball is one of the most energy expensive sports for parents. I mean, it must be a ten day a week, you know, sport. I mean, it's practice games, everything. Uh, and so what you have is this exhausted parent, who every day she has to take get her she gets the the fourteen year old into his uniform to get him to practice, and they have a fight about it every day. But finally, they get there. And finally, the mom says, and the counselor says, we have to fight about this all the time. Is it worth it? And the kid looks at her, this wonderful kind of look of wonder on his face. He says, what, what do you mean, is it worth it, mom? I hate getting ready to go. But I love it when I get there. And it's that kind of mix, you know, that the parent has to be ready to deal with. You know, you, you push, you know, and the kid... You know, because they're feeling more oppositional. So yeah, you, you, you don't know what I need. You can't tell me what to do. You're not right. Parent keeps the push. The kid gives consent. You know, so they get the, they able to give the protest up front. You know, they've looked after themselves that way. And now they're clear to enjoy, you know, the outcome. And I imagine that would be also the role that teachers could also play. It sounds like most of the roles that you're saying parents should be potentially playing. It's a, a good role for teachers. Is I'm, I'm kind of opening up possibilities for you, um, you know, so I invite you to try these out, but I'm not going to force these on you. Um, oh, yeah, no, I had a kid tell me about a uh, kid in older elementary school talked about it. This kid had a best friend. I got him was fifth or sixth grade. And this kid had historically been kind of put as, in a kind of a special needs category until he got into sixth grade and this kid saw his friend all of a sudden being treated differently by this teacher. And this kid came into full flower. And this kid saw, this kid saw that change in his friend and realized, you know, that that was a function of what that teacher did. Hmm. So that teacher did not get trapped up into the historical perception, historical prescription, you know, that teacher saw that kid independently as a person, free from all that, saw the possibilities, responded to those possibilities, and then the kid grew from that. Yeah. Oh, teachers are, teachers are hugely powerful. It's good to hear. Uh, so the, the last question I have for you, in fact, is um, I know in the world of education there's been, um, I don't want to say controversy, but there's been some researchers who have kind of criticized the way the self-esteem movement potentially worked in the, let's say, the 1970s, 1980s, yeah. where it was really about kind of praising children's kind of uniqueness, their, their gifts, things like that. So we have researchers like Sharon Black, uh, um, whose record is saying, you know, the problem with a lot of the way we think about how to do self-esteem is we have parents and teachers and others praising children's gifts and innate talents and look how talented you are and look how special you are rather than praising things like their effort their ability wow you put a lot of work into that and that really shows you see how your, your improvement here and basically the word resilience seems to come into play a lot i know you mentioned kind of the uh, earlier the idea that people need to learn to persevere through right. challenges so i wonder if you have any thoughts on the importance of let's say um instilling perseverance and a, a, what's called a growth mindset rather than instilling kind of, um, uh, you know, praise of innate talents and things like that. Well, I think, you I mean, definitely the discrimination you made earlier between effort and outcome is huge. I mean, 
in, in our life, you know, what we get, in, you know, what we work for uh, is not the same as what we get because effort doesn't guarantee outcome because outcome is multiply determined beyond our knowing. So sometimes effort will work, but sometimes it won't work. So a lot of times it's easy to, to kind of focus on outcome and reward the kid for the outcome. Great job. You did really well. Good for you. As opposed to taking a look at what led to that outcome, which was the effort. And, you know, and life, I think, pays off more on effort to be able to maintain your effort irrespective of outcome, enjoying the positive outcome. But when the negative outcome happens, you don't get blown away by it because you've got enough. And that's the issue. You have enough self-discipline to maintain ongoing effort. If, if I was going to teach anything in the schools, it would be self-discipline. It would be teaching the kid. You know, number one is, you know, when you make a commitment, you keep a commitment. Continuity of effort. You will maintain continuity of effort around good things that are important to you. And, and in terms of completion, you will finish what you start. Kids who have those skills, you know, are in a good place to maintain effort independent of outcome. Uh, and that's and that's what it takes. Once you get into the last stage of adolescence, I mean, that's why I think I mean, I don't know how, how it is where you are, but University of Texas, I think, has a 52, 53 percent retention rate. So these kids come out of high school and for various reasons, you know, they can't catch hold when they hit college. Well, I think part of the reason is that they have inadequate self-discipline skills, which is the ability to self-manage responsible effort on their own behalf. And they have to learn later what it really would have made a big difference if they had together at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. I know there was some thought, um, you know, with Carol Dweck and Angela Duckworth has this idea called grit, which is uh, what she frames as passion plus perseverance. And we don't really instill in schools. I think both these theorists agree. But we don't really instill in schools the idea of perseverance, the idea of uh, we're so focused in some ways on, you know, uh, everyone should get the A. Everyone needs to really focus on that A grade. But you really don't instill the idea of, okay, if you get a lower grade than that, there are things you can do to improve that process. And the C is not the end of the world. In fact, the C is a learning opportunity. Whereas we often in schools treat the C as, okay, you got to see, now we're going to move on to the next thing. You don't, you can't revise your projects. You can't do anything like that. Well, so I we mean, don't I, yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, there's a, you know, part of what we do is, you know, we have the system where we, you know, the kid ultimately takes a test. If they don't do well or they fail the test, you know, then they are given some kind of a failing emblem about that. that they have to deal with well, that forecloses on perseverance. I mean, that's why I always like Glasser's book, the uh, Schools Without Failure was absolutely right on. I mean, if you want to reduce somebody's self-esteem, you just fail and fail and fail and fail. Them. And that's, I mean, the issue is essentially saying, we're in the business of tracking your effort, you know, and seeing, you know, its relation to outcome, but we don't, you know, we don't judge you by your outcome. You know, what we do is we coach your effort uh, because I don't know, you know, what's the, what's the ultimate outcome you could get, but I think we can talk about self-managing effort right. and that's, and self-managing effort has to do with an esteem feeling way that you treat yourself believing, you know, that if you put in that effort, there are positive possibilities that await you. And that's what I would wish for you. Right. Hey, well, this has been a, a great interview. And I hope that people who watch this really get an idea of what they, as an adult in someone's life, whether they're a parent, a teacher, a counselor, etc., can do to potentially nurture, uh, you know, healthy self-esteem and good self-esteem. And be on guard against falling self-esteem. So, Dr. Picard, thank you for, for sitting down with us today. Oh, yeah, I enjoyed it. That was fun. Yeah, thank you.